Can I have five? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar number three stress management and coping strategies for resilience building. I'm Carmelita Nuki, the Executive Director of DAWN and the President of the Philippine Migrants Rights Watch. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. As a brief background, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected all sectors of society, including migrant women returnees and those in the destination countries. Displaced from their respective workplaces, a major issue that they are currently confronted with is the mental health due to distress and possible trauma brought by the pandemic. Many migrant women workers are forced to return home scarred or trapped in the country of destination, are prayed and anxious for their individual welfare, as well as those of their families. In this regard, Dawn, in partnership with the British Embassy, Manila, is organizing a series of webinar consultations starting October 2020 till February 2021. So as I mentioned earlier, Today's webinar number three is on stress management and coping strategies for resilience building. So to start with our program, may we call on Professor Aurora Abate de Jos, the president of the Dawn Board of Trustees and senior project director of WAGI for her welcome remarks. Hello, Oye, good afternoon. Please. Good afternoon to everyone. Hello to many of my friends, Carrie. Uh, and uh, others uh, I've not seen for many, many months. So uh, uh, as uh, president of the Board of Trustees I'd like to, of, of Dawn, I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, third edition of our webinar series. And um, I think that uh, we all agree that uh, this current situation has really been unprecedented for all of us. Um, uh, first off, uh, many organizations have, you know, been restricted by, uh, you know, the lack of mobility or, the, you know, the, all the restrictions that have been imposed on us and that we have had to resort to technology, uh, even uh, with the slowest internet connection in the world, which is what we have here in the Philippines. But uh, having said that, I think that... Um, um, uh, Dawn has, uh, for many years, uh, for, for those who are not familiar with the work of Dawn, has uh, been around for something like 20 or 25 years, Mel. And uh, during all of that time, uh, it has been helping communities of, uh, of uh, Filipino, uh, Japanese women and children uh, to um, improve their livelihood here in the Philippines and towards, uh, you know, the last five years or so, we have uh, kind of uh, added the attention given to trafficking victims as well as uh, migrant returnees. Um, the nature of Dawn is that it has always, it has always um, helped in promoting migrant rights um, globally as well as nationally. So it's very active in, in the promotion of uh, migrant rights, uh, particularly at a time when we are faced with a pandemic. Um, the third seminar that we will have now will uh, focus on a very important dimension of uh, 
uh, of our problem now, which is uh, ensuring the mental health and well-being of migrant uh, migrants, uh, both in the sending country as well as in the receiving country. Uh, because as we know, the Philippines is uh, very much scattered around the world. And in many cases, they, their dis discrimination as well as, uh, um, as, well as uh, violence and exploitation has been there for the longest time. But this particular period aggravates those situations. Um, so um, we, the, the, we are focusing on mental health and well-being because we know that uh, uh, this is an extraordinary situation, it's an emergency situation and humanitarian crisis. And for that reason, uh, we believe that it is uh, incumbent upon all of uh, our migrant groups to help to alleviate their situation by one, uh, I, I think that in most uh, countries now, there is an effort to provide uh, emergency food assistance as well as health assistance, uh, even while these are limited uh, in, in those countries. Uh, the second is that uh, because the nature of the crisis affects both countries, uh, receiving and sending countries, we're also faced with the most uh, alarming economic downturn uh, in many, many decades and for that reason we're faced with a truly uh, you know disturbing situation where uh, migrants who are so dependent on remittances for uh, the subsistence of the family we now have to face the prospect of even deeper poverty and perhaps in many many communities also the prospect of starvation uh, for that reason uh, also, uh, the, the level of anxiety, the level of stress, and the level of uh, mental health has uh, uh, been identified as one of the issues that need immediate assistance. Uh, of course, in the past, uh, we have paid attention to it, but uh, the, the COVID pandemic has really increased and intensified this problem. And I we appreciate the assistance given us by the British Embassy uh, for us to continue to provide this uh, platform to reach out to community leaders, to guidance counselors, uh, to other health professionals that need this capacity building in order to effectively assist our returning migrants and uh, for those uh, communities that they are serving. So uh, I hope that this seminar will uh, be fruitful and productive. And uh, I think we have our experts uh, with us, my colleagues in uh, Miriam College and uh, really experienced and expert in their field uh, to help us uh, uh, provide this kind of capacity building. So thank you on behalf of Dawn. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Oi, uh, for that um, sharing of what Don is doing and the present situation that we have now uh, because of uh, the COVID pandemic and for warmly welcoming the participants of this webinar. So now we would like to call on Mr. Ian Cox, the political counselor, the British Embassy Manila, for his, well, uh, for his opening remarks. Ian, please. Mom, Kamalita, Mom, Marora, um, uh, everybody participating, uh, thank you very much for the, the warm work, warm welcome. Uh, Magandang hapon. Uh, <laughs> it's really a great honor to um, be able to just say a, a few words at the beginning of this really important webinar today on behalf of the British Embassy. Um, it's been a privilege for us to be able to work with uh, Dawn to support support this series which um, as previous speakers have said covers incredibly important set of issues. I think integrating mental health and gender into our COVID-19 responses a shared priority for both uh, the UK and the Philippines. Um, as has already been said we, we live in exceedingly difficult times COVID-19 has completely reshaped the way we live, learn and work 
Um, but it's, uh, it's important that we um, remain optimistic um, and we look forward to the future and we try to find ways to address the new challenges that this pandemic has thrown up. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to see that the situation, while still very difficult with COVID, has improved a little bit in, in recent weeks in the Philippines. It's, it's good to see the cases um, coming down slightly here. I hope that trend will continue. Back home in the UK, we're, we're looking ahead to what looks like a, a very difficult winter, um, going back down into to lockdown and in the wrong direction wrong direction there but I, I hope it continues to be positive here um, I, I, I see that Filipinos remain hopeful about the future which is which is really good to see there was a recent survey that showed eight out of ten Filipinos are optimistic about overcoming COVID-19 testament to the resilience of, of people in this country and a, as a nation um, I think our two countries are confronting coronavirus in different ways um, but there's an increasing acknowledgement around the world that the pandemic is disproportionately affecting women who are already disadvantaged by existing gender equalities. And in particular, migrant women are much more vulnerable to the impacts of coronavirus. The UN recently reported that female migrant workers are more likely to contract the virus due to the precarious nature of their work and limited access to health care. There's also the heightened risks around job insecurity, abuse, trafficking and discrimination, among others. And um, to, due to all those reasons, I think it's absolutely right that we're collectively working together. Um, the UK and the Philippines, the British Embassy and organisations like Dawn and all those participating today to aim to empower um, female OFWs. Half of the OFW population are composed of women, uh, significant drivers of economic growth in the Philippines. Um, so this webinar will offer really, really important discussion on stress management, um, a topic that we, we all tend to overlook, um, and especially during the time of, of, of a pandemic. I'm complementing our work that we're doing with um, Dawn and Migrant Workers' Rights uh, are other initiatives that the Embassy is running to combat modern slavery and trafficking. Two of our priority areas are focused on addressing the, the scourge of online sexual exploitation of children, uh, as well as promoting labour rights in the time of COVID. If anybody is interested in, in knowing more about what we're doing in those two areas, then please do contact me or uh, our team. We're collaborating closely with local government units and civil society organisations in those undertakings. But I think that's, that's enough for me for now, but just to say thank you very much again to Dawn uh, and all of the participants and speakers for their time today. The lineup looks like a fantastic, uh, fantastic list, lots of expertise and really looking forward to the webinar. Thank you very much, Maraming Salabat. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, for that very inspiring uh, remarks and uh, for your appreciation of uh, our work in Dawn and for the partnership. Uh, and we hope um, we can later on, we will announce some um, webinars for November, as uh, mentioned by Professor Oi. So thank you very much. So now uh, we would like to have a, cl a cloud shot for our souvenir for this webinar. Okay. We request everyone to please um, turn on their video. Shane, please. Okay, one, two, three. Smile. One more. One. One, two, three. Smile. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, everyone. So now uh, we would like to introduce our two um, uh, distinguished speakers for this afternoon. Um, the first one is Dr. Jerry Jurisprudentia. Uh, he is a practicing licensed clinical psychologist and a licensed guidance counselor. He's also an associate professor and a former chairperson of the Department of Psychology, Miriam College. As an educator, he was the recipient 
of the President's Award for Teaching Excellence, the highest Miriam College Award in the tertiary level. He also received recognition from the Center for Education, Educational Measurement, and a sought after resource speaker. Dr. Je was also a board of director of the Psychological Association of the Philippines for a couple of years. He obtained his PhD in clinical psychology from the Ateneo de Manila University and his Master of Science in Guidance and Counseling from the De La Salle University. Dr. J is an advocate for women and children, a proud father of two daughters and an internal migrant. Our second speaker is Dr. Paz Agawili Manaligod. She is a certified developmental psychologist and a registered guidance counselor and psychologist. Currently, she teaches psychology and guidance courses at Miriam College. She serves as department chairperson for the graduate school of the College of Education at Miriam College from 2010 to 2020. She was board member and executive secretary and treasurer of the Psychological Association of the Philippines from 2010 to 2016. Dr. Paz was Vice President for Academic Affairs at the Coleo de San Lorenzo in Quezon City and also served as the Vice President and member of the Board of Trustees of the ADHD Society of the Philippines. She has published a book titled Educating Children with ADHD, The Philippine Experience. She received her doctoral degree in Child and Family Studies at Miriam College, a Master's of Science in Educational Measurement and Evaluation at the De La Salle University, and also completed her Master's of Arts degree in Guidance and Counseling. She holds a Bachelor's degree in Psychology at the College of the Holy Spirit in Manila. Our two um, speakers will be presenting one after the other. So the first presenter will be Dr. Um, Je um, for his presentation on, uh, on his topic for this afternoon. Dr. Je, please. Good afternoon to each and every one. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Cox, uh, for the support you uh, given to the Dawn efforts. Okay, so this is really very timely because uh, these uh, webinars are not simply to help our migrant workers, but at the same time to equip as well uh, people who are in the serving uh, uh, support for our migrant workers. And we hope that whatever you learn from these uh, talks this afternoon will surely enhance or help you uh, in your work for the migrant workers. So, Ms. Shane, can you please uh, open the slide? <clears throat> so the topic this afternoon is uh, migrant women returnees and migrant women workers resilience amidst the COVID-19 plus stressors. So as I have said, uh, this webinar is not simply to prepare and equip our migrant workers, but at the same time, help the service providers also uh, do their part. So where will you be coming in, in these uh, talks? So this will be uh, revealed later. So, but before I, I give my presentation, Allow me to share with you a video, okay? Pinalayas ng kanyang amo at namalangis sa kapsada ang isang kawawang OFW sa Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Matapos siya naman ang tamaan siya ng COVID-19. Dahil walang marapitan, sa social media niya idinaan ang pangino sa puro. Nakatutok si JP Soriano, eksklusibo. Hindi po ako, hindi po ako, hindi po ako, hindi po ako sa trabaho ko sa rehabilitation. Nagpasitipo pa mo, nagpasitipo ako ng COVID. Nang hihina po ako. Hindi ko kaya. Diyos ko. 
Ito ang panawagan ng OFW sa Saudi Arabia. Tago natin sa pangalang Leia. Ang panawagan ni Leia kumara sa social media at chat groups ng mga OFW sa Saudi. Wala raw na kuhang tuwing medical si Leia at nakapaalising pa raw siya ng kanyang employer. <coughs> Ilang oras matapos ipost ang video, nangyari ang kinatatakutan ni Leia. Pinaalis siya sa kanyang tinutuluyan at napadpad sa kalsada. Nakausap ng GMA News ang asawa ni Leia na nasa Pilipinas. Hindi pa malinaw sa kanya kung paano nalaman ni Leia na positibo siya sa COVID-19. Hindi na rin nila makontak kayo si Leia dahil naka-off ang cellphone nito. Labis na raw ang pag-aalala ng kanilang dalawang anak. Hinga ko ng tulong po sa NGC ng Pilipinas. Nakita si Leia na ilang OFW. Hingga ngayon, nandiyan pa sa labas. Six hours na siya dyan. Sana matulungan pa ng mga ano. Nais man nilang patuloyin, wala rin silang magawa dahil mamasukan din sila. Kaya din lang ipagbigay alam sa kinauukulan ang sitwasyon ni Leia. Inabutan, makakain. Alam! Pag-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-
But of course, definitely, we also expect that something has to come from there as well. Next slide, please. Okay. So what will be the outcome? So if you look at the other, uh, the left side of the slide, these are the signs of somebody who is getting overwhelmed compared to the other side of the slide we're in. The, the family, they may be far, yet they were still able to connect with their family of origin. So the person there, Leia was very clear. She was worried. She was tense. She was very, very tired. She was frightened. Why? Because when she, hit, when she was hit by COVID, what she feared most that the employer will kick her out came true. Now, she knew that once she has, she's out there in the streets, she will surely die. And the dream that she had when she left the Philippines to give good life, to give financial stability to the family will surely vanish. That is a very frightening situation, okay? And definitely depression will simply come in. Next slide, please. So without COVID, these are already distressors that can make our migrant workers vulnerable or even those who are coming in. No resources to share with their families. Ang iba, umuwi, walang pera. So ang iba naman, they don't want to come home anymore. Why? Because they are ashamed. They cannot face their families. No. They promised them a good life and here they are. They are a failure. And so for them, it's not just a, a depletion of resources, of savings for those who came home, but it can also be a loss of income and employment. And not only that, for those who are in destination countries, okay, their loved ones are very far from them. They're friends and they are cut off from their kababayan. And definitely, this is very, very scary. And I think, once again, I want to, uh, to highlight the role of the service providers, the NGOs, the GOs. How will you help so that continuity of social networks are provided to our kababayans who are in destination countries? Or even if they are simply here back at home, what do we give to assure them that they are not alone and forgotten? We call them mga bagong bayani. But of course, we don't want our bayani to end up in the bayani cemetery, wherein we can just give them lip service. But we really have to give them what they deserve. Next slide. And so what is the meaning of resilience then? So resilience is the capacity of the person to buffer herself from any crisis or adverse adversity. So before the crisis happens, what do you have to protect yourself before you went to the country of destination? Service providers, what did you give them? How did you prepare them? What kind of tips did you give them so that once they are there, they know how to navigate themselves in a foreign country? And not only that, resilience can also happen when you are already hit by the crisis. And so you expect the person to recover, to regain her ability, her balance, okay? So they are not exempted from any crisis. But of course, that resilience will only work if the adverse event is not long lasting. Because if the pressure builds up and becomes longer than expected and the resources are not there to uh, give them the strength, definitely it will, uh, what do you call, they will lose the, those resources and resilience will not be helping them at all. So we expect that the adverse situation may not be long lasting. And so what metaphor uh, can we use here? The metaphor of the oxygen mask. Okay. I know Many of you, you know, are familiar with the oxygen mask. I think nobody here 
from among the migrant workers uh, went to the destination country using a luxury liner. Definitely, you know, I don't know if there is one, but I think majority use an airplane. And once the, before the airplane takes off, the stewardess would uh, explain the procedure. So if the airplane experiences a crisis up there in the air, what happens? Expect that automatically the oxygen mask will come down from the ceiling. And so what happens then? If you have somebody beside you who is vulnerable, it's a no-no to give the oxygen mask first to your child or to anybody who is vulnerable. You have to do it first before you help. So in like manner, resilience is also like this. Our workers, our migrant workers should have already that automatic resource within them to help them face the crisis so that if they know that the Kababayan may also be experiencing a similar crisis in the destination country, at least they are safe to extend help to their Kababayan. So this is the the, the metaphor of the oxygen mass. But definitely the, the, the oxygen in the mass will also deplete. Kaya, we have also to see to it that the resilience, the resources of the migrant worker is enough to sustain him or her in adverse crises. Next slide. So what happens? What do you expect? With Leia, with the thinning resources, you expect that either she will bend or she will break. These are the only two choices. If her inner resource, that's why she was already verbalizing that, it, no? Nangihina na ako, my inner resources are thinning in. I cannot perhaps sustain this anymore because I am alone, I have nobody. I have just enough to sustain myself, but once it is depleted, I will surely break down. So the emotional resist uh, resilience is very important, but mind you, we have to see to it that they also get the necessary and immediate support, okay? So that adversity, we hope, will not end as a trauma because if it will end as a trauma, they will carry that with them until they come back to the Philippines and it will not easily fade away, no? Or if the perceived emotional stress is so overwhelming that they cannot anymore run away. Why? Because their back is in the wall. It's, it's, it's okay. It's un understandable if they were just working in the Philippines. But if you're working abroad, you have no relatives there. You don't speak the language. You have no, no friends. And definitely fighting chance will not be very, very uh, possible. And so if you don't have that coping ability, no support to give you. So again, this is where our NGOs and uh, service providers will come in. Before our workers leave the country, what do you give them? What tips, what training do you provide? For example, how to deal with hard employers, difficult employers. How do you uh, manage when you are alone, where do you go? So, to whom will you numbers will you will you keep uh, with you so that once you are there, you are not lost or uh, alone like what happened to to uh, Leia? She just found herself in the street. She had good that there were kababayans who were so secured that they extended help. So bumaba yung balde ng pagkain pero na merong kababayan sa taas ng building. So, yes, they were also constrained. Okay? They know that their employers will also reprimand them. But of course, they cannot be stopped when it comes to simply giving the basic need of their fellow kababayan. That is, if they have that uh, empathy, if they have that value within them, if not, they will simply turn their back as well. So, what do we expect from our uh, migrant workers? Do we expect them to break down or to bend? Because we know for a fact that every migrant woman will have different ways of reacting 
or handling the different adverse uh, uh, crises that come their way. Next slide. So what are the elements of resilience? Now here are the three elements of resilience. Learning, again, this is where our NGOs and service providers will be very handy before our migrant workers leave the country. What training do they give them? Okay, so what tips? Okay, like this, for example, you no. Know, how do you how do you handle your your inner resources? You no, know? kaya we call it tatag ng loob, you know? lakas loob. Iko wala kang lakas, so definitely manghihina ka. Okay, because they cannot give what they do not have, so it has to come from the NGOs or from the uh, government support so that they are well equipped to handle situations even if they are in foreign lands. So that is an element so they can adapt, so they can apply what they learn. And from there, they can become flexible. Look at these two women in the picture. One has about to, to break down no? while the other is still no? uh, able to manage and handle the crisis. But observe, look at her finger. She's trying to, to help, to reach out. No? Perhaps this other person was not well prepared. So how can I assist? No? So this is where psychological first aid can be very helpful. Yes, I have to take care of myself first, like that metaphor of the oxygen mask before I can help this person. Because if both of us are sinking, definitely nobody can help us, okay? So the reaction stress will differ from each individual migrant worker. Next slide. Okay. So what are the pillars of resilience? First, your tatag ng loob, emotional well-being. Okay. Where do you get your inner strength? What is your drive? You want to give a very beautiful uh, financial life to your family. Kaya nga you have that inner drive to leave the safety of your home. Okay? You are just high school graduate, but you took the risk, no? Sa palaran. Okay? You know, because that inner uh, drive will sustain you. You have that focus. But what if you don't have people to help you there? You have no friends. Like what they do once you are first time that you arrive to the destination country, right away the employers will confiscate your, your passport. They will tell you that you cannot leave. They will tell you that your cell phone is uh, confiscated. So definitely there is no way for you to build relationships. And so I think before they can do that, again, this is where our uh, migrant uh, organizations can prepare our workers, women workers, no? what to do in case they find themselves no? in a place where they are cut off. So what is the telephone line of the Philippine embassy? Who are the people that they can run to? Like, for example, if you are in Libya, who will be the people, contact people? who you can approach if you are in Lebanon, if you are in Qatar. So I think they need this. No? And they also have to be prepared physically because the challenge will not simply be emotional. It can also be physical. There was one migrant uh, domestic worker who said, imagine I have to clean a six floor house and there was no elevator. She had to start four o'clock in the morning and end 12 o'clock midnight, because there were six floors to clean. So if your physical endurance is not enough, mind you, you will easily get sick, even if you have the inner strength, inner focus. But if your physical uh, condition is not good enough, I think sooner or later, you will also break down. Okay? So you have to identify your 
uh, support. No, so again, I think uh, I am not aware. No, if if our migrant workers are given this small libretas, no, or booklets wherein they have all the the numbers of people in the country of destination that they can go to in case they find themselves in a very precarious situation. Okay, now next slide. So we know for a fact that they already have their inner resources in the past. Yes, but of course, if those inner resources were not enough, then I don't think that can sustain them. Now, so resilience is not just to buffer yourself. Resilience is also the ability to recover, to gain in spite of the loss. I think, uh, uh, I just don't know. One part of the plan is also to give you an exit plan. You know? It's just like watching a movie. When you watch a movie, you should know also what is the exit so that in case there is fire, you know where to go to for an emergency. Now, do we do that to our migrant workers? Do we give them an exit plan in case? What is their fallback? What, what assistance uh, does our embassy give them? Because there are too many, even our embassy workers are overwhelmed. No, there are hundreds and thousands of them in one country alone. Okay? Not to mention that there are also limitations, cultural uh, constraints, discrimination okay, uh, for foreigners. No? So uh, these are the things that our migrant workers had to hurdle. Okay? So, but of course, when you admit that uh, you need also an exit plan or you need a plan before you go to a country of destination, this is not an admission of weakness. This is not uh, an admission on the part of our government that they are not they are weak or they are not uh, helpful. No, but this is an admission that there is still room for improvement, that we can still do something to learn from our past experiences. And I think this is where we need the feedback of our migrant workers. And actually they already give us so much. And yet the support that they receive was simply a pittance. Okay, next slide. So I will challenge you because, okay, the way you look at the situation will depend on the way you perceive your experience. Now tell me, what do you see in the slide beside that statement? Anyone? What do you see? Can you put that on the chat box? Perhaps our staff can read, okay? Anybody? Any answer from uh, Ms. Shane? Are there answers from the chat box? What do we see? I think the, the usual answers our participants will, will give will be, oh, I see a chalice. Oh, I see two faces. And that's it. But mind you, look again because there are more than simply two images that you can see there. Can you see a table? Can you see a chess pawn, a chess piece? Can you see a stamp pad? Can you see a vacuum cleaner? You see, we are surprised because we thought you know, our ability to perceive and to interpret our stressful situations are simply very constrained and limited. No. If you have a positive way of looking at possibilities, then you are not boxed in. There are ways by which you can expand. There are so many choices that it, you can uh, do and that you can make. And so you are not simply limited to simply the chalice and the two faces. See, you might be surprised, no? Next slide, please. And so in like manner, if our migrant workers are left on their own resources, they are just like one rubber band. And if you sustain the pressure, 
sooner or later that the rubber band will break. But if the migrant worker sees herself together with other migrant workers, united with them, connecting with our NGOs, assisting them, then look what will happen. It will not easily break. It will take a while if they are together, the same with the hands. And this is where, again, our service providers in foreign uh, countries can come in, especially to assist our embassies, especially to provide flyers to our migrant workers or to welcome them because most of the time our migrant workers arrive at their country of destination with nobody welcoming, welcoming them except the employer. And so what happens to them? They do not know anybody. They know that they are just alone. They just have to go straight to the employer's house. But if there is somebody, an NGO welcoming them and turning them over to the employer, then they will know, oh, I am not alone. See, so this is very important for service providers, for NGOs in our country, and even for NGOs in foreign countries where we have our embassies, where they are represented, because we know our labor laws are not enough to protect them. Aside from our labor laws, we also have to respect the labor laws of the country of destination. Next slide. And so, what are the four A's for self-care and inner resilience? First is avoid. Okay? If you know to avoid the adverse situation, is it the person? Is it the employer? So if the employer is about to show interest on you, what will you do? Okay? Don't give the opportunity that you and the employer are alone. So you avoid you know, the situation. Or if you know that going to Qatar, for example, is a very uh, difficult uh, uh, challenge or country, then go somewhere else where you know that it is less stressful for you. But of course, if you cannot avoid the adverse situation because you are already there, then you should be ready to alter it, to change. No? So kung doon ka sa, sa bahay, no? katulad sa isang kaso, na lumalakad yung employee, nakahubad, naglilinis siya, then go to the room and lock, alter the environment. See? Find ways. You talk to the, to the wife. You see, even that you know, can alter the situation. You, you tell the employer, if you do that, I'll shout. Okay? Yeah, you, you, you will report me to the police. No? But then, no? the fact that you were shouting means something is wrong there. Okay? Now, Accept that there are also limitations, there are constraints, but you should not be uh, helpless. That acceptance, this is not forever. I know this might be difficult. I know this will be challenging for me. I know this will not happen over uh, uh, right away. No? And, and so I have to accept, but you also have to adapt the fourth A. No? So how will you adapt? Okay, so you should know how to, to associate or to collaborate or find ways if there are people in the vicinity from the Philippines as well. No? Katulad dyan kay, kay Leia. Hindi niya alam na may mga neighbors pala siya also from the Philippines. It so happened that uh, she was already kicked out and it, it was the, the, the Filipinas who called the Philippine Embassy. See? So Leia has no way to call the Philippine Embassy, but because they had that access, they were able to assist Leia. And so that's how our embassy personnel were <laughs> able to help. No? Okay? Because even the husband cannot con con contact Leia anymore. No? Wala lang siya, lost ba, low back na si Leia. Or uh, they don't know whether the, the cell phone was returned or not. No? So you either avoid, you alter, you accept, or you adapt. This is where your inner resilience, this will, will come in, no? will strengthen you. No? Next slide. Okay. So how do you know that your inner resilience uh, is more than enough? Uh, ano ang, ang uh, battery capacity na resilience mo? 
So these are the elements to assess you know, your resilience. You know? So uh, this might be very helpful also for our NGOs. You know, when you talk to our migrant workers who are interested to go abroad, tanyungin nyo sila, how is your home environment? Okay, secure base. You know? So uh, do you have a very loving and supportive family? What if you are alone in a country of destination? And then yung asawa mo, may iba pang babae. So definitely, that will already weaken your inner resource. So you rate yourself from 1 to 10. What is my home base resilience, the element? Because the reason why you left the country, because you know that you want to give a good life to your family. Okay? But if there is no family to come back home after one year or two, then that will really break you down. Second element, check. How are you able to uh, relate with people around you? Are you the type of person who is just simply very quiet? Or do you mingle? Because if you are a very quiet person, there is a big probability that you will be discriminated and that you will be exploited. And you cannot even assert yourself. So what is your social competence? Makahaluhabilo ka ba? Makaride on ka ba? So from 1 to 10, how do you rate yourself? Because most of the time, our migrant workers go to the country of destiny without even knowing their ability. Ang iba, they survive because may lakas loob sila. May matatag na loob. So they can survive. But for people who has no social competence, they just commit suicide. And there are many cases to confirm this. Okay? They are far from home. They are cut off from friends. No? Positive values, another element to uh, increase your resilience. <clears throat> what do you believe? Okay? What's your faith? Do you, are, are you a religious person? No? What gives you that uh, momentum, that courage? No? What do you believe? Do you believe in respect? We believe in human respect, but our employees don't. See, so they, they exploit us. Okay? But if you have that, no, sooner or later, if they see, oh, ha, matatag pala itong babae ito, no, may value siya, then I think I have to give her what she deserves. Second element, to check your resilience, your talents, if you're alone. No, use your, your singing ability. No? If you have talents, okay? Uh, marunong ka ba sumayaw? Marunong ka ba kumanta? Marunong ka ba sumulat ng poems? Then, use that to increase your inner resilience. And above all, also, establish friendships okay? with people around. Okay? And then, continue on uh, learning. Learn the language, learn the culture, okay? and uh, prepare yourself. Because if the pressure is more than what your resources can give you, definitely, pag itinimbang mo yan, bumigat ang pain, then your mental health is already compromised. See? Meron man mabigat, pero kung ang inner resources mo are enough, no? fully loaded ka, so you are not easily uh, broken. Okay? Next slide. Shade. So these are your inner resilience. We call the inner resilience flexibility, no? psychological flexibility. Okay? And flexibility can be expressed in your physical ability okay? to endure, your emotional ability to accept, okay? to regulate your emotions. You just don't easily give up. Your ability to bounce back because you know, making a kapitan ka, a creator that will sustain you. My mental ability ka to, to help you uh, and sustain you because you're, you're positive that everything will soon end, no? including COVID-19. Okay? So that will give you enough power to stretch and to be flexible. Next slide. Okay. So, but majority of the resilience will always, will always be coming from our home base. Kung our home base, you see, headquarters, no? 
kung sa train pa Central Station, paano pa makarating ang train kung ang main station is sira? Hindi na makagrahi ang train. Madiskarel siya. So the same, bakit nga ba umalis ang migrant worker? Because she knows that when she comes back, there is the family waiting for her, a husband who is loving, uh, uh, an extended family who will be uh, uh, waiting for the pasalubong. No? But of course, definitely is the nuclear family that is the most uh, important for the migrant worker. Okay? Kaya minsan, ayaw na nilang bumalik kung wala silang ipapakita sa mga kamag-anak na successful sila. No? That's the only thing. No? So uh, they would rather stay longer. Okay? I, I know of one. She missed so many milestones in her child's life. But she cannot go home because the, the, the children would all, Mommy, ang amin tuition. Mommy, sa ibis ang gusto sa umuwi. She knows that if she comes home, she will still spend. So she would rather stay and work and send the money. So she didn't even no, see her children graduating from elementary, high school, and college. That's why she was so, so, so sad because she saw her, her employer's children's milestones. No? Pero ang kanyang own family, she missed so much. Okay, so next slide. So this is now where okay, resilience can be uh, assured. No? It is not simply coming from the individual. Yes, we know that the individual may have her own. But if she knows that she's also assured that there are other people who will be there, magbibigay ng basket ng pagkain, tatawag ng embassy if she's in need. Now we know, then we know that we have the chance of surviving. And our community is stronger. Then our chances of coming back and seeing of our families will also be higher. Okay, next slide. And so, what is the challenge? It is not the load that breaks us down, the migrant worker. It is the way you carry the load. So if your resilience will not be enough, then sure enough, no amount, even if your, your load is so small, but if there is no way, hindi ka marunong bumitbit ng adverse uh, uh, pressure, then it will pull you down to the drain. No? So next slide. So with that, so you have to decide. Migrant workers, okay, will you bend or will you break? Our migrant uh, uh, NGOs, the supporters, will you help our migrant workers bend or will you simply allow them to break down as well? And with this, thank you very much. Take Thank it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. J, for that very comprehensive and timely presentation. And um, the video about Leia is just one of the cases. And a lot of our a lot of our migrant workers have similar experiences. You know? So I'm sure later on um, many of uh, us will have questions. And let's do that in the open forum. But before that, let's uh, let's have Dr. Maya Paz Manaligod um, to have her presentation on managing our stressors. Dr. Paz, please. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Let me share the screen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jerry, for that. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm here also to talk. Yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, how we would manage our stressors. Uh, Doc J gave uh, a very good uh, introduction to my topic because he talked about being resilient. No, I like especially the end part when he mentioned that it's how we uh, it's how we look at our stressor. Am I okay? No, that would uh, either uh, change or or break us. Okay, so I, I like that line because. Uh, specifically for my topic, I will be looking, we will be looking into how we manage our stress. Do you see my slide? Okay. Yes. Yes, Doc. Yeah. Okay, so I want you to see perhaps in the chat box or Shane can help me here. 
what number are you at this point in time in terms of your stress? Are you one? I'm okay. Two, I don't know. Or three, ay nako, masyado akong stress ngayon. So maybe put that at, at, uh, in your mind or maybe use the chat box so that at least we can see, you know, where are we, mga participants ngayon, where are we at this point in time? Three, one. One, okay. Okay, do we have something there? So maybe just put that in your mind so that at least we know where we are at this point, okay? And maybe in your mind, just, uh, mentally write down, no? Ano yung mga stressors ninyo at this point in time also, no? Ano yung one, two, three? What are your stressors? And we will also see, uh, Doc J mentioned also, some stressors that we might be feeling now, okay? Specifically, he mentioned the stressors that uh, our migrant uh, workers might also be experiencing at this point in time. Okay. Now let's look into some of the common stressors. Maybe what something that I will be talking about this afternoon. So common stressors, we know this, no? Because of COVID-19, maybe yung pamilya na medyo problematic na, mas lalong nagka-problema. Or it could be also the opposite, no? May problema sila but they are working together now because they need to help one another. Or yung pamilya na okay, ngayon mas magulo kasi lahat sila stressed out. Okay, so relationship is something that could also cause uh, our stress. Okay, of course we know this, no? Economic difficulties, nawala na ng trabaho, doesn't know what to do. Others naman, no? Uh, maybe it's better for them, but definitely a lot of people now have problems, no? Because there's really a change, no? In, in how things are going and we're talking about uh, a global economic uh, breakdown, no? That's happening now. And of course, health, no? Where will we get the finances also to what? In case we get sick of COVID, alam natin, napakamahal, no? Kaya others siguro hindi na pumupunta sa hospital because they know that once they're there, sunod-sunod na, you pay for the PPE, you pay for all of those things, no? And also when you're sick, no? Your other uh, members of the family will also be stressed out and it can also have a toll in your relationship because of a disease okay and when also you're stressed out remember immune system natin bumababa uh, it goes down no we, we, it weakens because of stress our career no yung work natin sa ibang bansa no so we worry uuwi na ako pero anong uuwian ko doon diba ako yung breadwinner what will happen there okay and and even worldwide, no, we see that uh, one fourth of employees view their jobs as the number one stressor in their lives. That's why even even to mga companies and all they give, no, mga stress management uh, webinars or workshops as of now, no, because they know that uh, you cannot work well if you're also under stress. Okay, so uh, it's also strongly associated, no, with health complaints, okay, than any other life stressor. So that's. Uh, health, career, family, safety, our own personal safety, okay? And also the safety of our loved ones, no? So kung we always look at the data, it's good. Uh, Mr. Ayan also mentioned, no, that at least here in the Philippines, no? Medyo it's going down, it's getting better, but in Europe, grabe talaga, di ba? Especially when we will have the cold season and we're talking about uh, the second wave. Okay, we see it happening. We see it also happening in, in the US, no? But that's also number one. Maybe safety also for our migrant workers, no? Yung, yung kwento ni Leia, saan siya pupunta, no? Sinong kakilala niya doon, no? Who will also protect me, no? If uh, something, if I have employees who are not... Uh, Employers who are not uh, 
good no in terms of how they would treat uh these migrant workers so that's also something that we think about even i even i'm sure people or, or migrant workers from abroad they're also worrying about the safety of their own family even for us no personally we worry about community para bang when we uh, get out of our home para tayong sumasabak sa gera di ba we put on our face mask daladala natin yung alcohol natin daladala uh, we always remember social distancing no buti nga dito sa Philippines face mask face shield pa rin so it's really uh, we we really taking care of ourselves no and uh, let's look into th for it again to to come alive in us let's see no the effects of these stressors so this is also how we look at stress kasi sinasabi hindi naman ako makapagtrabaho kung kung walang push i need a certain stress to make me perform okay and yet and truly there's a there's a theory to that no in terms of us doing well so kung too little yung yung ano natin yung too stress no too little yung stress natin sometimes ano lang tayo uh, we're very compliant diba low yung performance natin we don't really do well no kung tamang tama lang that's why we have really to learn no yung sinasabi nga work life balance no because if if it's in the middle it's balance we have good performance we do well okay work and also perhaps in terms of our well-being no pero kung very high like like dr j said no kasi kulang yung resources was padaming pressure we will also have low performance and uh this was the theory of uh Celia when he was talking about our general adaptation syndrome we have the use stress which is the positive stress oh, a pleasant form of stress caused by a desirable stimuli no it enhances person's performance okay like for example uh a positive stress that we have perhaps no is what has happened no covid-19 no even if we, even if we say that ay nako ang dami bad na nangyari there are some positive stresses that it gives no we're more hygienic now no we take care of our surroundings no we take care of the plants no we uh how we call this uh in terms of climate change we remember that maybe part of that stress also we are able to connect with one another even if it's not physical but because of what has happened no it has also given us a form of a positive stress what we don't like is the negative stress no because this causes sleepless nights mental agitation okay and if it's a prolonged exposure that was mentioned a while ago no it can again uh, have harmful effects on our uh, well-being so benefits of stress it can motivate us yes it can energize us to do better okay and it can make us productive so some people sinabi okay na wala na ako ng trabaho what can i do so they can be very creative ano na yung pwede kong gawin so nakita na natin ngayon ang daming mga online businesses uh, they were trying to to check on what they can do what what do they have no aside from what they're being used to so we see the creativity of people now because perhaps of the positive stress that was given to them and in this uh presentation you see no how stress affects the body yan bakit nagpapalpitate ako bakit may headache na naman ako ngayon di ba bakit uh pimples lumalabas skin irritations no maybe these are signs that you're under stress so the, your body is reacting no your mind you cannot decide no you have bad dreams okay or perhaps you always worry you cannot make good decisions because again stress is bothering you behavior no you get clumsy maybe some of you drink more so that they can sleep better which is also a negative way of doing things but it doesn't stop anything no uh you can sleep at night okay uh, you become more restless hindi kayo makapakali and in terms of emotions also no parang uh, you're not as confident as you were before no even maybe mothers who are staying at home they say it's this the way uh, tinuturo ko ba yung tama sa anak ko diyan sa online lesson niya and all of those things you can get irritable okay 
you can even alienate yourself from people because you don't feel well. So these are things that could happen. So when we look at stress, it could be physical symptoms. Maybe some of you pa, di ba? Biglang tumaas yung, yung ano, may high blood pressure and all. And then we also say, it's so hard to go to the hospital right now. Nakakatakot, di ba? Others also, no? They, they are so angry with life. They're anxious. They're bored. They're depressed. Medyo tense, no? Sometimes sumasakit din dito, no? Because sometimes this is the tension area, right? And with this prolonged exposure to stress, we can be very angry. We can be very hostile. We can hate the world. And we see this happening, no? Of all places. The United States of America, ano? I mean, all of these are happening. Black Lives Matter. Everybody's angry with one another, no? And this could, again, be part of that psychological problem that we're feeling now, no? So, in terms of behavior, sleep disorders, others sinasabi nga ay nako, weight gain ako ngayon, o kaya I cannot eat well, no? Alcohol, that's why there was a time, if you remember, nung ano natin, bawal yung bumili ng alcohol because they know that, that most people might use this as an, as an excuse. So, there was a time, wala talaga nagtitinda ng alcohol during that lockdown, okay? And again, uh, in extreme cases, people become violent and even attack other people. And we see this happening. Okay? So we try to look into the general adaptation syndrome na sinasabi, no? So our system, we're built in a way, no? That we have the alarm stage, no? External stressors causes uh, biochemical and psycholo psychological changes in the body. So alarm stage yan. Okay. Oh, bakit kaya I'm having again palpitations? Bakit na naman kaya nag-headache na naman ako? Bakit parang hindi na naman ako maka, uh, maka breathe, no? I'm having a hard time breathing. I'm having, again, skin irritations. You, uh, those are already signs, no? Na under stress ka na. And we have our own way of responding to stress. Kaya, importante din that you, you are also aware, no? Of certain reactions. And even when we know it's the alarm stage, yung ano natin is we resist, no? We always say, Hindi wala yan, kayang-kaya ko yan, di ba? So, we try to devise a plan to resist uh, the stress. Kaya nga yung sinasabi kanina, yung the fight or flight response. And if you remember the, the, uh, the last webinar, webinar, either we do the emotion uh, focus coping or the problem focus coping, okay? But the important thing is this, we don't reach this stage, the exhaustion stage, Okay? Because pag, hini, pag hinintay natin and we go to this stage, no, we will already feel drained because this is the final stage. So sana tayo, we don't reach this stage. No? This is what we call the preventive measure. Because once we're here, we would already feel depleted of all our, our energy and talagang, yung sinasabi ni Dr. J, magbre-breakdown na tayo. The rope might, have been, might be broken already. So when a person does not want to perform a particular activity or is una unable to do it well, he may feel exhausted and prolonged exposure to this situation may again result in a breakdown, depression, or burnout. So before we reach that exhaustion stage, importante nga, we're able to manage no? these stressors before the stress manages us. Okay? So what is very important ourselves no we should be aware that we are under stress kasi if we also deny hindi wala yan we won't do anything so awareness is very important so what do we do we must also believe no that uh, being overstressed no is dangerous for our health we should also perceive that this is a serious condition no? when we are overstressed. And we should believe also that the benefits, no? there are benefits when we practice some recommended behavior as shown in studies on how to manage your stress. So we have tips there. And the tips that uh, we will be giving you are really based on studies and how it has helped people. Another thing also, when, 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 when you try to give uh, distress management tips, no, 
the person should also have the key to action, okay? And the person uh, should also believe that, yes, he has to do something about it. Kasi walang mangyayari if the person is in denial, no? And sabi, ay, di wala yan, kaya ko pa ito. So these are some of, us, of the simple and practical steps that we can follow. Number one niya, no? Relax, diba? And it comes from the Latin word, eraxare, no? Meaning to loosen up, Okay? And letting go, no? If there's nothing that you can do about it anymore, don't cling unto it. Let it go. Loosen up, no? And number one dyan, importante talaga is sleep. Why? Because sleep uh, would conserve energy and restores energy. Kaya karamihan, kung depressed ang isang tao or hindi mapakali, yung anong munang sinasabi, let's not talk first, sleep muna. Then maybe tomorrow, would be better. Especially in relationships, di ba? Parang nasanay tayo na, ay nako, we will not go to bed. Wala ba tutulog kung hindi pa tayo nag-usap? Paano pa kayo mag-uusap kung pareho pa kayo, like a husband and wife, mataas pa yung energy level ninyo, galit, you're still angry with one another. How can you talk? That's why one, one uh, studies would show now that the best way to do it is sleep ka muna. Wag mo na ngayon. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do it next day when emotions are down. Pero di ba, may, may one saying that says, no, don't go to sleep unless we settle things. But sometimes it pays to wait. Very important also is we take a nap every now and then, no? Because it helps uh, reduce our fatigue and improve performance. So what are some of these things that will uh, avoid, uh, that will make us avoid uh, the feeling of relaxation? So make sure again, no? You also take care of yourself. Avoid working long hours. No? You need a break every now and then. No? Pag hindi masyadong ma-stress yung katawan ninyo. Your imagination. Remember when we always ruminate, ruminate, and worry, and worry. So we have to say, we have to do something. A positive distraction. So that we don't again start ruminating about negative things. And a part of that again is repetitive thinking. When we keep on worrying and worrying. And it doesn't do us any good. But we don't want to let go of the worry. Okay? So, yung sinabi nga, free yourself from worry. What do you do about that? So, be friends with your worry. Diba? Bakit ba ako nag-worry? How important is, this, is, the, is the worry that I have at this point in time? Baka may iba pang priorities na dapat kong gawin instead of worrying about this. Now, if your worry is constructive, then maybe check, no? What are the things, then, then, uh, what are the things that I can do then? So this is where the problem-focused uh, coping comes in, no? But in any event that perhaps uh, you cannot change the situation, eh, you have to accept it and stop willing about it. Wala ka nang magawa eh. Did we ever think that, like now, no? Did we ever think that a pandemic would come? Did we ever think na kasama tayo na Philippines will, all, will, will also be, you know, under this global pandemic? That was December when we were just saying, ano ba naman sa China, pagkatapos pala sa atin, March, no? So what do we do now, no? So, yung sinasabi nga, the virus is already part of our life. What do we do? What do we know? Uh, wear the face mask, social distancing, that's the thing that we can do at this point in time, okay? And sometimes when, when we talk about this, pag nangyari na, nangyari na. So we cannot do anything about it anymore, but we have to move forward. So part of this also is your thoughts control, okay? Controlling your thoughts, no? See, I'm starting to worry again. I'm starting to worry again. So come back to the present moment. Keep busy with something that gives you joy, okay? And just tell yourself again, stop, no? Yung sinasabi nga ni Doc, ni Doc J, we have to adapt, control, no? Avoid. So these are some of the things that we can do, no? Yung sinabi nga, work on your attitude. How do you react to stress? It's determined by how you perceive a particular event. So we have to paradigm uh, shift. Reframe your response by acknowledging that the stress event is outside of you and you have no control of it. No? But you can control how you see that stress. Okay? So when you say, okay, I don't like this pandemic, no? what is happening, but what is the other side? What is the other side of this pandemic? What are uh, the positive things that has happened? That's where you think positively, no? And think about successes that you had in your past, no? That will again help you become resilient. 
Kaya nga, it's very important always for us to celebrate no? good times and success because when we will feel down or depressed, dito tayo humuhugot no? na I also had good times in life and this will help me no? go through uh, what do you call this, my troublesome uh, days at this point in time. Again, see the power of the mind, no? Take a mental vacation. So imagine, visualize, no? From a postcard or a poster, somewhere you would want to feel a safe. Yung sinasabi nga, uh, look to the future, you know, say after this. It's, it's okay to daydream, no? If it will make you resilient and make you happy for the moment, no? So it's important to anyway, when I go home, kahit wala akong madalang pera, I'm with my family, we are all together, there will always be a way no, to, to settle this problem. Okay? And we can say, no, tomorrow is yet another day. That's my favorite line from what? Uh, Scarlett O'Hara, Gone with the Wind. Okay? Tomorrow is yet another day. There will always be perhaps the right time for this. And we also use affirmations, no? Nakaya ko naman noon. Maybe kakayanin ko ngayon, no? I believe in myself. I know that the Lord is always there for me. I believe that uh, prayers will help me. Okay? So that's very important. Very important also for you to count to 10, no? Before you, you feel stressed out, papalpitate, okay, breathe muna. Count 1 to 10, no? And maybe uh, uh, I will be less worried. Okay? Or... Sometimes also, uh, it's also important when you feel stressed out, you're looking at one thing, try to look at another, you look again at another uh, picture, no? That would again, uh, in a way, no? Give you this positive uh, vibes, no? Because sometimes this would also help in terms of uh, eye muscles when you're worrying so much about so many things. Sometimes, no? It's rin if like you are with a group, no? And they're talking about uh, all these things, all negative thoughts, etc. Maybe get yourself out of the situation because you, you then start to feel that you're palpitating. You start to feel again that you're ruminating because you're with this group who are talking about so many negative things. So get out, maybe walk around, exercise, dance. Okay, so these are the things that, that could happen. If we would have time, it would be nice to practice also breathing exercises. But maybe you can look at this, no? Close your mouth and inhale through your nose for a count of four. Then again, uh, hold your breath, count to seven. Then exhale, count, count to eight, no? Breathing exercises have been shown, no? To be very effective, no? In coping with stress. Why? Because usually the uh, energy, uh, what you call this, oxygen, no, goes to your brain. It relaxes you, no. That's why usually breathing. So maybe when you're into counseling or talking to a stressed out uh, migrant worker, instead of talking, muna, okay, mag breathe in, breathe out, muna tayo, di ba? Let's uh, ano muna, relax muna tayo before we talk about your concern. So that could really help, okay? Or if not, we always use this to so yell or cry, no. So again. If the environment is okay, you have to release the tension. You know what I do, no? If I want to yell, of course, I cannot yell kasi yung mga neighbors will say, anong nangyayari? I put a pillow, no? A pillow and I yell, no? And I cry. Di ba? Ang sarap patulog after crying because you're releasing the tension inside of your system. Sabi nga dyan, eh, di ba? Keep calm and shout on. Or laugh. There's such a thing. We have a student, it's a... Uh, Laughter yoga, and he talks about, you know, even if you don't feel like laughing, pretend to laugh. Because when you laugh heartily, it's, it's something again to do with oxygen and neurotransmitters in your system, no? And you will feel better. So watch a comedy film, etc., or force yourself to laugh, even if you don't feel laugh, like laughing, because that can, that can help, okay? Stretching, which we can do every now and then. Stretch. Maybe if you are with your uh, fellow OFW workers, you try to massage one another, diba? Because very important, human touch, no? That, that would make you feel safe, no? So, so these things, no? So maybe before uh, uh, OFW would, would go out to work, maybe they know some massage techniques, etc. So that they, they know how to do self-care. 
listen to re relaxation music or perhaps nature sounds, no? The sound of the beach, the wave, no? Chirping of the birds, no? Bring that with you because maybe when, if you will go abroad, it might not be there, but you have these sounds, no? That remind you of your hometown. It will make you feel safe, okay? It would relax you. It would inspire you, okay? Or uh, it's very important to have a, a photo of a loved one, a family, by your test in your wallet so that when, when, when you feel down, take it out, look at it, and say, uh, to do better, okay? Uh, this is also very nice, no? When you have, a, your, you have your own care box, self-care box or your happy box, so that if you feel lonely and all, buksan ninyo yung happy box ninyo. Ah, nandyan, nandyan yung, ano, how do you call this? White flower to help me, mga ganon. O, andyan yung chocolate ko. No? This, this will make me feel happy. I have letters from my husband telling me how much he loves me, my children. I have this, uh, this letter from my former employee who told me that I know that I can do great these things. No? Very important as well no? is that... Uh, we give someone a compliment, we share a joke with someone, we smile at someone or even at ourselves. No, that's also humor, no? We have to find humor in, in a certain situation. So our body stress response also has benefits for social bonding. Studies would show if our stress levels are on the rise, we also release no, oxytocin, which signals a need for us to have social connection. Kaya at this time, no? At this time of pandemic, we find that we really uh, go with people, no? We feel that closer bond and we're kinder to people. Even if we're looking at all this through uh, virtual connection, di ba? Yung mga hindi nagre-reunion before, na physically ngayon, they do reunion via uh, Zoom, no? So even in the midst of social distancing, it is essential that we stay connected with others. We have to be deliberate and intentional about the use again of social media, no? Because social media might give you the fake news, news that are distressing, and we have control, no? Not to listen to these things, okay? So we, uh, we would look into uh, good ways, no? Of, of, connect, of connecting with people. And studies would show, that's why this is what we want, no? Positive emotions and people with more positive emotions, it could decrease our feelings of anxiety. It speeds up our recovery from illness. It could also prevent illness. It allows us to deal with stressful situations better. We can have higher incomes because we work better, more praise at work. We are viewed as more likable, competent, and intelligent. Kaya nga, very important no? when, when, an, when a worker goes out, makita, Kumusta kaya yung assessment ng resiliency level ng taong ito? So that we know that would be less problematic when this person goes out. No? They even experience more creativity. They can find a lot of new ideas. They can be more efficient in making decisions. They live longer and they're more persistent and have better task performance. Okay, so I'm rushing because I'm looking at the time. So hopefully, uh, these tips that uh, we have given you can help build your resilience to uh, manage your stress better. This, this was, uh, no? she paints during the pandemic and she made it into a face mask. So that's how she dealt with uh, the stress of the pandemic. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Paz, for those tips. Thank you. I'm sure... Um, a lot of the participants will also have some questions later. So um, now let's um, go to our open forum. But before that, I would like to introduce briefly our facilitator. Mr. Proilan Malit Jr. is an associate at the Gulf Labor Markets and Migration, a research fellow at the UP Dilimancipal Program, and a managing director of Rights Corridor a regional news platform and research on migration and rights issues. Over the past decade, Froilan has lived and worked across the Gulf region, working as technical and migration policy consultant for a number of regional and international organizations, including the Abu Dhabi Dialogue, ILO, and IOM. 
He's also an advisory committee member for the ILO Regional Office for Arab States Migration Advisory Group and previously held visiting research positions at the American University of Sharjah and Zayed University. He has previously published numerous peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and policy papers exploring migration issues in the Gulf region. He holds degrees from Cornell University, the University of Oxford, and a migration certificate from the European University Institute. He is currently studying international relations in the Department of Police at Cambridge. Royland, please. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Carmelita, for the um, generous introduction. And again, I'm really happy uh, to be part of this webinar and the fabulous presentations from Dr. Jerry and Dr. Maria Paz. I think a lot of their presentations, um, they, they complement and they really highlight the most important issue that a lot of migrant workers are facing right now, which is stress management and how do we actually cope with these issues, uh, given the financial precariousness of a lot of our migrant workers in the Gulf. So I'll just summarize it in three minutes, um, some of the key points and I'll proceed with the Q&A with, uh, with our audience. So as Dr. Jerry highlighted, I mean, COVID has really highlighted the multi-level limits of uh, migrant resilience. Migrants are actually facing these limits sending countries, especially their diplomatic missions, as well as the NGOs um, operating in the host country, and in some cases, in the Philippines as well. And that's why the need for you know, the role of service providers actually become even more important. But COVID-19 is also a test of motherhood, brotherhood, and fatherhood for a lot of migrants. And it's a test that, in fact, when I did a lot of interviews here, one migrant specifically said, the most difficult part of being a migrant is the fact that you're not being able to send, the fact that you're not even, you know, have the capacity to send money back home. That's the difficult part, actually. Um, and, and I think that's what challenges a lot of them. That's what, that's what heightens their pressure. You know, the pressure that Dr. Maria Paz and Dr. Jerry really highlighted. Now, Gulf markets, even Asian markets have slowly reopened. So now they're able to breathe um, and ease sort of the financial pressures, but it's still there because the different categories of sectors, domestic work in particular, uh, there's no vulnerability there because of their isolation. And, and remember in the Gulf region, your right to stay is also, right to employment is also linked to right to your stay. So there's precariousness there where it can really expel you or you can get be deported out of it. And I think the, the strategies that uh, Dr. Maria Paz has highlighted are very, very important. Um, the laughter, the happy box, the friends, the power of touch, and social bonding. And actually, I wanna add too that the diasporic ethnic enclaves in the Middle East in particular have been an important source of um, communities. You know, has Filipinos recreate these, the nation, how they recreate uh, the Philippines within these ethnic enclaves. Uh, these are important sites of studies that I think are going to be very, very useful, not just uh, for our researchers, but also for our diplomatic missions, uh, who are currently um, putting a lot of uh, effort to communicate with our migrant workers. And, and yeah, so I think these are some of the key points. Um, there's a lot of them, um, but I think I want to open it up to the, for the Q&A. And, um, and yeah, um, if you have any questions, uh, please put them on the chat box and I will call you out. Um, 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 while we wait for uh, these particular questions, I think I wanna raise the first question to Dr. Jerry. Dr. Jerry, you've used the, the case of Saudi, and I think you're also broadly looking at the Middle East here. So the first question, Dr. Jerry, is how strong are the current institutional frameworks that we have um, to enable Filipino migrants to effectively cope with stress management in the host country, just, just by looking at diplomatic missions um, based on the field studies and interviews that you've done so far? Uh... Uh, thank you uh, for that very important question, Freiland. I think uh, 
every service provider may have their own strategies. Uh, but uh, the problem is collaborating and connecting because it looks like either they are duplicating or they are not they are competing with one another so there should be uh, a common stand no? because of course our migrant workers may be coming from different regions and may have different uh, uh, links with different organizations so but they should not be something that will be competitive but rather uh, what can we do wherein we can standardize our our assistance to the point that uh, kahit saan sila pupunta, they know and they can expect that that will still be the same uh, emergency support they can get from the different uh, organizations. So I think uh, uh, this is very challenging and uh, critical because even the government and the and agencies and uh, our NGOs uh, may not be able, they may agree, no? but they may not be able to see eye to eye as to what exactly will they do okay, to address. So, siguro ito ang pinaka-importante. Like for example, there is no organized program as uh, when we send our workers abroad. They are on their own. Uh, employer lang lang ang sasalo. So, what happens? So, they, they will never, uh, they, they will contract worker will not uh, feel safe. So, sinong dadatnan ko dyan? Sino? <laughs> and then, the first thing that the employer will say, she doesn't even know how to speak English while well, our uh, domestic word knows. So, that alone is already a, uh, a hand grant. So, they will just give them signal, oh, you can follow me. And then, after that. So, that is already a, a big uh, turn off. No? So, siguro, so, what does our embassy uh, in different... Uh, country, especially in the Middle East, uh, do to assure that when they arrive there, their presence are felt? Or what do we do before they leave? What training do we provide to them wherever they go, especially from among the different uh, uh, recruiting agencies? Because sometimes they sila just to, to cut root, uh, cut root yan ang competition. No? So, siguro, uh, uh, that's, how, that's what we have to look into, perhaps. No? So, that's what my, uh, my take is no? at this point in time. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Jerry, for that very important point. Before I get into uh, Dr. Maria Paz, I think yeah, embassies function as eyes and ears right, of the Philippine state, and they function as frontline um, institutions in host countries. I think it would be very interesting to hear from Ms. Annie Mendoza. Uh, she's our... Um, officer from Riyadh, uh, Ms. Annie Mendoza. I think it'll be interesting to hear her perspective um, regarding uh, your point, Dr. Jerry. Ms. Annie? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was not, uh, well, because I have at least uh, being attended. Anyway, uh, what I have experienced when I was uh, the, the social welfare attache in Kuwait and now in Malaysia, uh, the OWA uh, usually uh, conduct the pre-departure orientation before they are deployed, especially for the domestic household, domestic workers. Uh, also here in Malaysia, uh, before the lockdown or even the, before the pandemic uh, uh, it was uh, in, in full blown, we conduct uh, at the FWRC, we call it the post-arrival orientation seminar. Uh, wherein we, me as the social welfare attache, my topic is uh, coping with stress and uh, uh, how to deal with the uh, loneliness and the other attached agencies like the Department of Trade, the Trade Attaché, they will be di discussing uh, financial management. Um, also, the other other um, members of the Assistance to Nationals uh, and also the the welfare officer who is also on top of this activity. 
they provide uh, how to deal with the abuse, how to report uh, certain uh, conditions uh, which is not indicated in their contract. And they were also advised to memorize the, the telephone number of the agency uh, so that whatever happened to them, the agency will be responsible in uh, taking care of them and in providing them uh, 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 services or support uh, that, they, that they need. Uh, right now, we have a very strong um, coordination with the POLO, OWA, and the ATM, the Assistance to Nationals, in terms of providing uh, counseling and psychosocial support for both documented and undocumented Filipinos here in Malaysia. Uh, usually, we conduct it uh, because of the lockdown. We conduct it uh, virtually and also sometimes uh, telephone counseling. Uh, while the actual provision of services uh, right now, we are doing that through uh, our Philcom leaders uh, who are uh, who are there as the, our frontliner. Uh, the, the problem now uh, basically is for their, uh, their mental health condition because uh, they have been, uh, uh, most of them, they have been uh, no pay, no work uh, scheme and they're uh, worried and how will they give support to their family in the Philippines. So it's really a, a double whammy in terms of uh, being stressful situation. Uh, right now, uh, Malaysia, here in Kuala Lumpur, we are we an unconditional movement control order, like a conditional lockdown. So, so business is affected. So the, their employers are also uh, um, uh, worried. How can how can how can they uh, provide support to the to those, even to those documented, more so for our undocumented, which is a very which is a large number here in Kuala Lumpur, especially also in Sabah. So right now, uh, we are working closely with the uh, OWA, the Polo OWA, and also the ATN case officers, so that we will be able to provide uh, even virtually or uh, direct assistance to, the, to, the, to our distressed uh, overseas Filipinos here in Malaysia. Uh, thank you um, to our officer. Uh, I think uh, that, that, that conduct of uh, PAO, so that we call it the post-arrival, is a very, a very good strategy on how do we build resiliency among our uh, uh, overseas Filipino workers. Uh, because they will be more competent or, or more um, um, capable of, uh, and they are more prepared to whenever that particular situation happened to them. Uh, I think they will be more equipped with the uh, necessary skills and emotional uh, readiness to, to either to accept, to adapt to that particular stressful situation. Thank you um, um, to our officer, Ms. Annie Mendoza, uh, for your point. Um, our officer, another officer from Riyadh, um, I, I made a mistake earlier, so I apologize for that. Uh, Ms. Teresita Valentino, um, our welfare officer uh, from Riyadh. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Well, while we wait uh, for Ms. Teresita, um, there are seven um, social welfare attaches presently available in destination countries uh, for Filipino workers. Um, yeah, uh, I think we have, we have eight uh, posts uh, where we have uh, social welfare attaches. Eight. And I think... Uh, our attaché in uh, Riyadh is also with us this afternoon. Maybe she can share also uh, Tess Valentino. Because 
Uh, I think uh, the, the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, we have reported a lot of uh, cases in terms of uh, abuse. And uh, uh, here in Malaysia, not so, not so much uh, cases. Uh, uh, the, the labor um, attaché here, uh, I think uh, we have no, not much report in terms of uh, uh, distress uh, documented uh, uh, Filipino workers. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sita? Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning, Paul, Mr. Sita, um, our officer. Um, yes. uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry, Dr. Jerry presented uh, for you in video uh, to Saudi Arabia, and it would be interesting to hear your perspective uh, related to his point. I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Jerry uh, presented the case of Leia, a distressed uh, Filipino domestic worker in Saudi, and we wanted to know your thoughts about related uh, um, issues related to uh, role of our embassies and even stress and coping mechanisms of migrant domestic workers in Saudi. Yes, the, the situation of Mary Grace before was really hard because that was the height of the lockdown in Riyadh. So nobody can go out to assist her personally except those uh, co Filipinos near her location. But uh, I think the Philippine Embassy has done so much to address her needs by <clears throat> coordinating with the Saudi government on how, on how other people can reach out to that lady during that uh, situation. And then um, still during the height of pandemic, no one can go out to at least talk to her personally or bring her to a nearest doctor except that uh, because the Ministry of Health ordered before that it should be uh, all medical cases should be attended by ambulance. So uh, there's so much we can do than to reach out with the Ministry of Health to send the ambulance to pick her up on her location and give her medical attention during that time. Thank you, Paul, uh, for your intervention. Um, Dr. Maria Paz, um, in linking point with Dr. Jerry and Mr. Asita from Saudi Arabia, um, the issue of stress, stress management, um, it runs through not just among domestic workers, other OFWs, but also among frontline officers, not yeah. social yeah. welfare, labor attaches. So what would you recommend in terms of handling these varieties of cases especially in point po ng ating uh, officers sa Saudi Arabia, Mr. Asita. Uh, that was at the height ng, ng COVID-19. And even in so Dubai, actually, close lahat, government offices. So there were literally no social welfare institutions to help Filipino workers. So what were the recommendations that you would, you would give them? I said, this, this is the most important frontline aspect ng ating diplomatic missions. Thank you. Yeah, ideally, I think I can also answer the uh, something that Mr. Paul wanted to say. You know? uh, I think it's very important, ideally, really, for all the stakeholders you know, to at least learn. They have to learn because sometimes managing stress in kultura natin, we always say, kaya ko to, kaya ko to. I don't want to be weak. You know? So they should also learn that it's sometimes you know, we undergo stress and it's okay that if we get physically sick, we can also be uh, mentally sick in a way because we're depressed and, and, and we cannot uh, do or perform our work well. Ideally, it would be best no, if lahat ng stakeholders, frontliners, those in the embassy, and those who will be going out of the country to work, aside from having the, the seminar, because sometimes you know it here, but you're not practicing it. Diba? So, sana, it's a it's a day to day thing, no? It's a process that you have to learn, no? How to manage your stress. It comes with the knowledge, but the practice would come later on when you when you see what works for you. And and we and if we say that all of us can manage our stress because we've learned how to do this already, building resilience, no? Then. Uh, we can help 
ourselves more that will be less trouble diba so that if we have also perhaps a friend who stress out then we can be there for uh, our friend because we also have built that resilience and if we are the one who's also depressed at the point of time our friend can also be there to help us so definitely it has to be interconnected and we all have to really also learn that it's okay at times that we are not okay and these are studies that have been learned these are studies that have been proven that it works okay and maybe we can start with simple practices no until it becomes part parang second nature na sa atin Thank you, uh, Dr. Maria Paz, for that point. I, I think the uh, role of our institutions are very important, and I think the need to protect not just our workers, but also our frontline officers matter a lot in terms of upholding our migration governance strategies in the whole country. Um, Dr. Jerry and our social welfare attache, Anya, also talked about the importance of pre-departure and post-arrival, especially post-arrival um, orientation services in the host country are very, very important to reorient OFW workers arriving in, in the Gulf region or in other parts of the world. I think I want to hear from Dr. Um, from our welfare officer, Amy Chrysostomo uh, from Polo, Tokyo. Um, how integrated um, Itopong uh, stress management so Atima institutional structures from pre-departure to post-arrival. How strongly are these enforced? I think Dr. Jerry has highlighted the need to rethink about these institutions and their strength in terms of educating and or even making it more accessible to OFWs. Um, our officer, um, well, uh, welfare officer, Amy Grossostomo, um, what do you say, Paul? Um, let's start from an institution and I'll go with Dr. Jerry and Dr. Maria Paz in terms of how do we think about them? Uh, Hi, Fräulein. Good afternoon. And at the same time, thank you, Dr. Jerry. Thank you, Dr. Pass. And even thank you, Mom Carl, for uh, inviting me once again this afternoon. Actually, uh, I really wanted to attend this, uh, this webinar because I wanted to be refreshed once again with a coping mechanism. As what Fräulein has been telling us, it's not only the workers are being stressed. We two frontliners are always faced with stress in our workplace, especially the pressure, pressure from the work, pressure from the colleagues, pressure from the clients, and pressure even from their, our head offices. All this pressure at times, at, at the same time, uh, it caused too much uh, uh, problem within us, mentally, physically, we're also, uh, disturb of all these pressures and at times when we're dealing with our clients you have to be emotionally sound and spiritually sound because you can address to their queries to their issues raised for you so uh, all those coping mechanisms once again which Dr. Paz had shared had really helped me a lot in 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 facing all this stress. But you know, at times, it's not only those coping mechanisms that, uh, that really can help, but it's how you look at all this stress within you, okay? And the fact that we cannot just open it up, even with our friends, because there are sensitive issues at times that are being raised to us. Too sensitive enough that we cannot just share it to anybody because these are cases. And these cases at times are really, uh, uh, it really causes us too much pressure, so much stress, because we don't know how to handle a time with this kind of situation. So uh, as what Froilan is telling, uh, the mechanism itself, <laughs> had started to be PIDOS and and the PAOS is the post-arrival orientation seminar, okay? Actually, you're right that the, the workers before the deployment uh, has been briefed on what are they going to expect in coming to each and every 
uh, countries of destination. But you know, as per my experience as a welfare officer, I've been here for uh, how many years already from one country to another. It <coughs> means that our workers really, during attendance in the pre-departure orientation, are not so keen and so absorb with whatever we're talking about during the pidos they're not they're not so interested actually as if they just took this this trainings just to meet with the requirements because once they're in the countries of destinations and when we talk to them most of them are telling that we are preoccupied the time. That's why we cannot remember all these things. And even in our post-arrival orientation seminar, the PAOS, some workers also attended this training because it's part of the requirement and they are not really focused. So at times when they run to you and seek your help, I always ask them, did you able uh, were you able to attend this kind of orientation didn't owa inform you about these things before your deployment so that you will be pre prepared because you have to know that if you're going to this kind of country you know what are you to expect especially the language barrier cultural differences we cannot just say that we simply live in the Philippines with this kind of culture. We can, we can bring it in other countries. There are restrictions and these things must be followed. So that's why the PAOS, uh, the PIDOS and the PAOS itself is really good in preparing our workers. But the question now, are these workers really focused during the time they attended the seminar or the trainings at all? I, I don't believe so. That's the very important thing that we must really inform our workers that they have to be serious whenever they attended this kind of seminars because it will really help them a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you to our, our welfare officer, um, Ms. Chrysostomo. Um, I think I want to go to Dr. Maria Paz and see what she thinks of um, our welfare officer and then Dr. Jerry. Um, I want to add to Dr. Maria Paz that, uh, as we know, pedos and PAOs are protective, you know, protection mechanisms employed by our government in the host country. And that social media also has played a role in terms of yeah. making these programs more accountable. So the pressure is even much higher as well for our frontline social welfare and um, attaches actually in the host country. So what do you say to these, Dr. Maria Paz and then Dr. Jerry? Yeah, uh, that's really very valid, no? And we understand that because if you look at it really, you know, uh, the workers are excited to go to the other country, right? And they're all looking at the positive aspect. They don't even want to think about those problems, yes. no? Because when they think about those problems, no, parang kaya nga pumunta ako dito because all I want is this happy things and the future will be good. That's why that, that would be very normal. I understand where they're coming from. Like, look at, look at uh, the current situation now. Everybody's going into webinars for mental health because ngayon nakikita na natin na kailangan natin because of the pandemic. And we know that that will increase along the way. So parang, I mean, I think it's the mechanism of people. If you, if you think you don't need it or it's not current right now, you will not pay attention to it. Okay? So maybe, I, uh, I don't know. I, I, can, I can give a suggestion. Perhaps when we talk about the training, maybe you can put uh, something there like, if this happens to you when you are there, what will you do? So that at least nakikita na natin how will they act? How will they know? So parang we look into hypothetical cases, no? So that at least prepared na sila na, na pag isipan nila yan. Okay? So maybe, 
or uh, if you can also have sa real people, mga testimonials mm-hmm. na parang this has helped me rock na nasabi ito sa akin noon and it has helped me, then maybe uh, they can, what do you call this, they can empathize, no? And maybe they can see that uh, what you're telling us really may happen. So I, I, those, those might be some suggestions because we have to see it from where they're coming from. Diba? Na, na for them, all is good. Diba? All will be well. Yeah. Diba? But they have to, to look na those are possibilities really. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maria Paz, for your point. And also, um, Dr. Jerry, before I give you the floor, um, Ms. Lucid from DSWD also um, has a question. What do you recommend and how do we improve the conduct of PDOS and PAOS? Dr. Jerry. Dr. Jerry? Okay. I think this is something that uh, the government and the involved NGOs had to sit down. Uh, perhaps uh, those who are directly handling our, our migrant workers may have some recommendations. Because like, for example, we have these PIDOS and yet how come we still have so many undocumented migrant workers? Where did they come from? Saan sila nang galing? How come nakalusot sila? No? And so, how do we, how do we protect in a way that uh, nobody should have a shortcut? Okay? So, I think the ones who are very much experienced are the recruitment agencies. No? And uh, uh, because they are the ones who are directly uh, involved in recruitment and they know the, the concerns and the the complaints of migrants, siguro through them, they can bring this up and sit down. No? Ano bang mga loopholes? Kasi, yeah, I, I, I understand. No? So, I am just wondering, with this, this PIDOS and this uh, PAUS, mayroon ba tayong exit plan? Like, for example, yeah, nakalusot na, hindi siya nakikinig. Pero pag nandun na, ano ang ating exit plan that we give them? Para, uy, nakalimutan ko yung last time na nag-attend. Pero, ah, ito pala ang gagawin namin pag in case we are caught at the middle of a crisis. Pinaalis kami ng employer. Now, or, uh, pinalayas ako sa so, alatotakbuhan ko. Anong NGO na malapit dito? Because now, kasi usually, that can uh, perhaps uh, bring them back. So, kasi minsan, pag hindi ka nakakapit sa patalib, Nawawala ka doon kasi yeah, as what, doctor, out of excitement, ayaw mo na makinig pa na maraming mga training training na yan kasi you just want to leave. But sometimes once you are, when your, your back is at the wall, then you realize, oh my God, so I don't have to face this, but what do I have to face this? What is my exit plan? So I am just wondering, do we provide them an exit plan so that uh, they, can, they can still have a way you know, to to navigate themselves so that they cannot, they will not be trapped at the middle. No? So, ano ang ating exit plan no? sa, sa ating mga... So, yun lang siguro ang, ang aking uh, uh, recommendation for the... Uh, thank you, Dr. Jerry, for that, you know, these key points. I mean, I think it raises now a bigger questions about the post-COVID migration governance of the Philippine government, especially in destination countries. And I think I'm, we're gonna need more work, actually more help from our um, officials from destination countries um, and from our experts in the Philippines. Uh, there's one more question, two more questions actually that are very central to this discussion. Uh, I think I wanna start with Dr. Maria Paz. So you talked about one of the cultural traits of Filipinos, yung tatag ng loob, right? And with Gulf markets, even Asian markets are slow, slowly reopening and wages are being cut by 50%. So Filipinos are, don't have choice but to be resilient, um, especially in destination countries. Now, some employers actually will exploit that because they know that the markets, both here and abroad, are very difficult and you see more mobility constraints and it's more costly to go home because there are no other open labor markets that are open. Um, so what do you see, in terms of like, uh, yung culture being exploited by employers in the labor market. Now, 
how can we actually empower our diplomatic missions uh, in particular with regards to training, making it more uh, uh, virtually accessible and enable them to actually, to actually further assist Filipino migrant workers uh, who will continue to deal with these problems um, as pressures from their home countries, their families, uh, build up over time. Dr. Maria Paz. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sir Fordan, Flordan. So it's very important really, the tag ng loob, that was also mentioned by uh, Doc Jerry, no? it's there. No? And we don't want to remove that. No? They went there with all the confidence, with all the hope. No? And certainly, like you said, it might be exploited. So talaga importante din that uh, the person knows what are my rights. No? Uh, am I empowered? So that they also know when to say no. Diba? I think part of our culture also with the Filipinos, kung kaya pa, kaya pa eh. But then we forget hanggang kailan yan, no? Because the rope might break. So that awareness again na hanggang dito lang ang kaya ko. You always have to, to think back and si kaya ko pa ba to ask those questions, no? How am I feeling right now? So that at that time you will say, no, not now. Maybe another time. So learn also how to ask for help because that will also empower you. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness, so maybe we should also change that paradigm, no? But it's a sign of strength also because you also believe that others will be able to help you, okay? And, and that would also uh, strengthen, no? Connections we may have with one another, especially when we are in another country. Okay, so important din yan so that yung, yung uh, value din natin ng, how will I call this? It's not balik bayan, eh, yung uh, <laughs> helping one another, yung uh, kababayan mo, uh, like you carry the house, di ba? Everybody in the neighborhood carry the house of a neighbor. So that, that's very important. Magkabalikat tayong lahat. Okay? Thank you, uh, Dr. Maria Paz. Dr. Jerry? I think one important mechanism that I see that is very essential is uh, information dissemination. Because it looks like the ones who are receiving information about migration are simply the ones who are in Metro Manila. But for those who are coming from the provinces, they don't have any information. And that is why uh, illegal recruitment would take advantage of this. And uh, because they are at the mercy of uh, uh, an economic situation, they bite the bullet. Huh? But if we have an organized campaign uh, all throughout, this is what is expected from uh, uh, an OFW and uh, encourage them to connect with local government and local government will will uh, assist them when they go to Manila. Uh, like I said, like for example, in, uh, uh, I know of one from Singapore. They, they, the employees love to get Filipino workers, right? Because one element that they have that other countries don't, they know how to speak English. But then, why do they bite the bullet of getting the amount, even if it's half the price that they, they have to, because back home, they don't even have anything at all. So they would rather have at least that pretense wherein they have a semblance of uh, livelihood than having an empty plate. So that's why, so if, but if the information that they have in the problem are also limited, their decision making also is constrained because information is power. How can I make a better decision if I don't have the information? But, uh, for example, they are, they are told, okay, uh, if you go to this country, you will have this much to receive. But then once they are there, what is their fallback? It suddenly, uh, the employer will say, well, our practice here is this. Uh, we have to get your passport. We have to confiscate your, your uh, cell phones. And your contract has to be changed. No? So what is the what is the fallback of the migrant? Will she come home? Will she will she say okay? I will not work anymore because she just simply arrived there. So, but if she has that that uh, awareness already, aha! If my employers say that the 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 contract is changed, 
then how am I be protected? Okay, so should I go to the embassy? Or now again, another a problem there is many of our migrant workers are also undocumented. So definitely they don't want to be monitored. So and they are scared to be to be reported or else they will be sent back home. And they don't have any protection. So nagskipagsapalaran pa rin sila, no? Just because uh, that's the reason why they left. Mabuti pang mamatay kami dito sa ibang bansa na at least may opportunity to send money back na mamatay kami na gutom talaga sa Pilipinas. So that's another reality. No? So uh, the, the, the challenge is really uh, gargantuan. No? And, kaya siguro this is really an effort from the government and from the those who are providing services. No? Because uh, we are the only ones who can uh, we also benefit from the, the market workers, the, the man and the, the send back home, support us also. They pay for our salaries, they pay for the economy to, to go on. But then, no, uh, sad to say that uh, for those who are not covered by our protection, they are at the mercy of those who are, who are exploiters and traffickers and drug uh, whatever, no? uh, suppliers. So... Uh, this is really an effort. So I just don't know if uh, the idea of having one uh, department may work well so that uh, we can we can really pull our resources together rather, ha rather than having so many departments, but uh, we are not able to really uh, even identify you are coming in, you are going out because of uh, inaccuracy of data. Uh, that's my take. Uh, uh, Sir Ferdinand. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jerry, for that very important point. I think your presentations in webinar, webinars one and three uh, really highlight the need to globalize social welfare support for our Filipino migrants globally. And we have currently eight uh, social welfare attaches and diplomatic posts. And a lot of reports, ILO, Amnesty, a lot of rights groups really highlight that COVID will intensify trafficking, exploitation, abuse, et cetera, et cetera. I think I want to hear from Ms. Lucid uh, from DSWD because she plays a central role in terms of uh, managing our officials uh, in destination countries. Ms. Lucid from DSWD. And then I'll go with um, our DSWD um, officers uh, in destination countries. Ms. Lucid? Um, Ms. Lucid from the Assembly D. Uh, I'm sorry, I had a, I, I had to attend for a call. I didn't get the. Uh, Ms. Lucita, um, the expert opinions from Dr. Jerry and Dr. Maria Paz highlight the need to globalize social welfare support. We do have fantastic eight social welfare attaches and also labor attaches in the host country. A lot of rights groups say, and even policy reports from the ILO, abuses will intensify with COVID, trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts on this, um, um, Ms. Lucita? And what are the top three strategies that you're foreseeing right now that we need to employ urgently to address issues related to mental health and stress management for OFWs in destination countries? Thank you. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, thank you for the question. But anyway, yeah, so issues on trafficking is uh, always addressed uh, by an interagency effort. So the SWD is one among those and uh, our uh, attache at the post is the representative of the department. And uh, basically, our ATN officer is always uh, the designated focal persons on trafficking. And uh, for all other cases similar to that, uh, trafficking or any other uh, category of cases, they would always um, a need for uh, mental health no, and psychosocial intervention. And that uh, we are trying to really enhance and uh, uh, maintain the skills no, of our attache. So it's a very, very basic uh, requirement for, for one to become an attache, to be equipped and knowledgeable and experienced in the handling of uh, these cases. 
So even here in the Philippines, so uh, these are the ones that our attaches are handling. And uh, uh, one good connection is that while uh, the attaches is uh, dealing with the uh, um, the mental health or other issues of the OFW, then the DSWD Home Office is dealing with the family, to which uh, the concerns of our OFW uh, about their families once they have problem abroad is a primary consideration. So it's a, it's a simultaneous effort uh, in handling the case. And uh, as of now, we see really the need, no? and uh, perhaps the DSWD now is... Uh, um, in the progress of developing a program, we call it uh, Y Support. Uh, WI stands for wireless, and then support, of course, uh, the psychosocial support no, in mental health. And this will equip uh, social workers of the department. And uh, basically, um, we have uh, been doing this, the interagency, the collaboration and coordination, but I think uh, more focus no, on the mental health issues because, well, uh, perhaps we can, uh, we can uh, consider that uh, that's one aspect that the pandemic has, uh, has uh, made us aware of that uh, really uh, is not only economic or uh, uh, the present concern about uh, losing a job, but the mental health status. So just like what we are doing at the airport, uh, the that uh, we are encouraging the accomplishment of the DAS 21. DAS stands for depression, anxiety, stress, scale 21 from the DOH. And uh, we generate no, the, the result of it. And uh, with that, we would uh, reach out and uh, we would uh, uh, provide online counseling for this. And uh, that is being done uh, down the line. So from our SWATs abroad to the home office here in Manila and down to the field offices. So, uh, and uh, another is uh, the engagement, no? Uh, but provide technical assistance for the readiness, the embrace of the local government on this concern. Because uh, basically, uh, this one aspect that we, the government, no? Through the, the, the national government, through the local government, to really uh, provide them support and technical assistance on this. Because uh, uh, if national government has been, uh, shall we say, we are, are we are not all ready no, to face this uh, pandemic, but down, down, down the line, on the ground, we really have to um, support our local government. So I think uh, the, those are the main uh, issues and uh, top uh, concerns that uh, we can look into, especially us in the government. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucita, for that very important point. Um, if, if we zoom in now with, you know, in these destination countries, um, uh, Ms. Annie from DSWD as well also highlighted a very important point that frontliners have reg must have regular stress debriefing sessions to keep, quote, our sanity. Uh, Ms. Annie, would you like to expand a bit more on that, um, given the importance of the point that you've raised uh, in the chat box? Oh. Not, not necessarily in the condition of Saba, but we as frontliners, because we are all, always besieged with requests, with uh, the need for assistance, uh, and also for our own uh, for our own sanity, because uh, because we are all so living here alone, uh, we are away from our families. Uh, we also worry on the pandemic uh, situation. But uh, other than that, I think uh, we should also have some kind of debriefing uh, because almost every day we receive uh, calls, we receive uh, requests, and uh, we always attend to them. Uh, because sometimes they just really need some, someone to talk with. To, to somebody who will listen to their, to their problems, even uh, some domestic abuse. Uh, it, it, it's really uh, physically and emotionally draining for us, uh, so, for us social workers or for us social worker attaches. So it's really up to us. I, I really appreciate what uh, Doc Gary, uh, yung last slide niya na, uh, yung, the, how you carry the load. So it's up to us uh, how we can cope with this uh, stressful situation. And that should be uh, capacitate our, our, our partner clients. 
uh, how to deal with this kind of situation. Uh, not just uh, being reactive to that particular situation, but to be more proactive that because all these all these things will sometimes it will happen to you, and we do not know how 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 your rubber band will stretch. And if you don't if you don't feel the support of other maybe other colleagues or other uh, from your home office or even from your family, I think uh, it is very important that. Uh, we have to care also for our caregivers. You, that, that, that's the point that I was like to driving at that maybe baka nakakalimutan nila na tao din kami <laughs> na kailangan din namin ng, uh, ng suporta hindi kami naman kami superman at saka superwoman na at hindi naman financial uh, support lang ang pwedeng asahan sa amin at uh, they, lalo na ngayon sa panahon na ito na talagang yung mental health yung just giving hope yung the feeling of helplessness yun ang ating iwasan kasi the, the fact na nawala na nawala na yung isang isang hibla ng kanilang uh, ng kanilang pag-asa doon bibigay at doon bibigay at doon kayo kaya tayo mga mga frontliners o tayo mga uh, mental health givers psychology social workers yun siguro ang mas bigyan natin ngayon ng ng pansin dahil yung yung isolation the isol the feeling of isolation the feeling of being alone the feeling of uh, having no one to share, uh, wala kang wala kang load, wala kang wala kang wala kang way na walang internet, wala kang way na makakonek doon sa mga tao na sa palagay mo makakatulong. So yun yung mga isa sa mga dapat siguro nating uh, i-consider. Right now, uh, uh, yung aming head ng ATN, we are planning for something parang virtual counseling na through the Facebook page ng, ng embassy. Uh, we will allot a certain date and time na kung saan ako ay pwede na makausap at pwede akong makakonek. Kasi para alam ng mga tao, kasi mas maano ngayon sa Facebook eh, di ba? At uh, at least may assurance sila na merong makakausap sila at merong, merong makikinig sa kanilang mga uh, karanasan, sa kanilang mga problema. Kung wala man agad-agad na direct na assistance, at least they can look forward to other support mechanism or other support system which the embassy can give. Thank you, Ms. Ani, uh, for your insights. I mean, I mean, I think what, what Ms. Ani is also pointing out is that social welfare officers are also migrant workers of different categories. Um, al although they are linked to our governmental system, they're also vulnerable and susceptible to all these sure. challenges that a lot of migrant workers face. I, have, I happen to have worked with, uh, with uh, our former um, welfare officer here in Dubai, uh, Ms. Mabel, and I work with a lot of our attaches in Kuwait and Qatar. And the, the work that they do is very tough. They deal with the cases inside our consulate. They have to go to labor court, um, to the morgue, to different jails, or even um, deportation centers, immigration centers. So their time is really bound. I mean, if you think about it, they government offices are often close at 2 p.m., you know, and they have very limited time. So instead of like, you know, stretching out full protection, like for the whole day, they have to prioritize and they have to deal with massive and massive loads of cases. I wrote my dissertation at Oxford, specifically looking at the role of frontline uh, welfare workers in Qatar, where I spent a year. And so I, I do have some insights in that. I think uh, if we could bring in Miss Teresita Valentino, because she, she is in Riyadh at the moment, one of the top posts uh, for um, OFWs. Um, I think let, let, let's hear her thoughts and then Miss Amy and then our experts and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Miss Teresita Valentino, um, what do you think are, I would say, top two 
um, elements of, that the, our government need to do to sort of increase our capacity within the diplomatic missions. And at the same time, perhaps you could highlight some of the innovative work that you're currently doing to reach out uh, to our OFW communities in Riyadh, given the intensity and issues that Dr. Jerry has highlighted in his presentation. Um, Ms. Teresita Valentino. Um, yes, thank you for that. I think we, uh, the government should strengthen the conduct of PIDOS because this is where the OFWs are coming from, uh, what are they going to do here, the realization, the reality of their task to be done here, and all, all the things uh, that happens here should be um, faithfully discussed during PIDOS so that the, the OFWs are not, uh, what this, uh, culture shock because most of them, especially the household service workers, when they arrive here, uh, as if they have uh, what this? They have nothing. Uh, they have no orientation at all, uh, especially when it comes to the culture, the uh, what's this? Um, the language, and uh, this is the start that they are abused. And um, because as we have learned, the PIDOS is being, I think it's just being done by some serv uh, accredited service providers that I do not know if they have the, the full capacity to speak about what is going to happen when the workers are already in the country of their destinations. And um, for innovations, uh, we are trying to reach out to these OFWs through the accredited or organized registered Filipino communities because there are uh, Filipino communities who conduct uh, what this livelihood skills training so that the skills of these OFWs would be at least upgraded so that they will not be uh, forever end up as household service workers or cleaners or waitresses. So, uh, the DSWD in Riyadh can just do so much because uh, we know Saudi Arabia has some uh, restrictions. No, uh, uh, it's very hard to what's this to overcome because uh, mahigpet, mahigpet yung kanilang mga batas when it comes to dealing with uh, expatriates and these OFWs. But uh, we have uh, to do things. Uh, especially dun sa mga household service workers natin because they are the most vulnerable sectors here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sita, for your point. I was told that uh, um, my time is up now, um, but I want to add only two specific points now for my recommendation. One, I think there's a need to increase, hopefully, the number of Arabic interpreters. Uh, within diplomatic missions, especially Arabic language within those specific countries, because Arabic, it, it varies. Those who can speak and write at the same time, because it consumes a lot of time for a lot of welfare officers to file cases in different, you know, cases, uh, courts here, et cetera, et cetera, in the Gulf region. Second, um, we need to hire more researchers, actually. Um, a lot of our officers don't have time to really look at comparative best practices that could work. Uh, to improve their operations. So I think it's very important to build up that capacity as well and really take into account the role of gender in precariousness in these markets. Thank you, Ms. Carmelita. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over now. Thank you to our experts and our officials uh, in destination countries. Salam Thank you very much, Froilan. And I think um, that was a very exciting and informative uh, open forum. No, uh, But before... Um, the closing. Uh, let let me acknowledge the participants that we had we had this afternoon. So we had representatives from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, um, from CMA Center for Migrant Advocacy, from DOH Region Three. There are several participants from there. Uh, Pastor Ding, our board secretary in Don, Sir Lito Soriano of LBS. Uh, we have, um, I already mentioned the OH Region 3. Uh, then we have, of course, OWA Tokyo. Uh, Paul Michael Baviera, he's the founder of OFW, ang mga makabagong bayani group. I, I think may message din siya kanina. Uh, Ron Bautista from UK Embassy. 
We also have representatives from the Archdiocese and Commission on Migrants and Itinerant People from Pampanga. Then representatives from Stella Maris Seafarer Center. Of course, we have um, Ms. Teresita Valentino from Riyadh. Uh, si Ms. Lucid Villanueva, of course, no? she's the head of uh, the office in charge of this uh, uh, social worker attache. Si Ms. Annie Mendoza, uh, of course, very important na nandito yung tatlo nating uh, assigned sa, sa uh, post at nakapag-share sila. No? And then we also have... Um, uh, of course, our speakers. So I will thank them in the next um, uh, part of the program. So in closing, we would like to thank, of course, our two distinguished speakers, Dr. J and uh, Dr. Paz, for their very um, insightful and timely and the many tips that we got from them. And of course, Proilan for facilitating the open forum. Thanks to sa inyong lahat for your participation dito sa ating webinar 3 on stress management and coping strategies for resilience building. Actually, ang target natin dito, di ba, migrant women returnees and those in the destination countries. Pero I think tayo naman lahat, di ba, because of the pandemic, stress na stress din tayo. So very helpful din ito sa atin, no? plus the tips. Uh, of course, we would like uh, to invite everyone for the last um, webinar natin for this October. Uh, the webinar is on parenting in the light of the COVID-19, strengthening family relationships. This will be on Saturday, October 24, from 2 to 4 then. No? So uh, Dr. J is also one of the speakers and we have this island season. Uh, and then of course, in response to the suggestion earlier, no. Uh, uh, in response to the suggestion on um, care for caregivers, in November we have a series of webinars also on mental health and um, uh, on mental health and um, so psychosocial interventions. So we hope uh, our social workers, our attaches welfare officers, uh, and guidance counselors can join us in this, no? Uh, it's really uh, for your suggestion kanina ni Ms. Annie na, of course, uh, you need, no? you also need to, to have interventions, to have some repressors. So we thought of that. That's why our uh, second, our November uh, webinars uh, will be for caregivers. Uh, it will be like the third and fourth week of November. So we will let you know po, uh, the details of this. We hope you can uh, uh, join those uh, webinars. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, sorry, nag-extend po ng oras, but it's very interesting discussion, di ba? So um, thank you very much, and uh, let's all keep safe. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye bye po. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Miss Abigail, salamat po. Miss Rose, si Ma'am Carita Ran. So, uh, thank you, Ma'am, for attending. Thank you. Story thank you, Ma'am. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank, 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 thank you, Ma'am. Congratulations. Thank you, po. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Sana sa thank November you. we can invite the other ano, yes. swat. Yes. Madami pa. <laughs> Nikki, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Okay, design on 28. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, naman yung thanks. Bye, bye. Mary Jane Jose, thank you, Paul. Miss Abigail. Miss Clary, Rose Clary, thank you, din po. Maraming salamat din sa lahat. Wow, Rose Clary, narinig mo mudra. <laughs> Dance, thank you, ah.
Thank you. Thank you rin sa Rice Corridor team who have been support, uh, supporting us. Si Ma'am Oy, of course, at saka si uh, Mr. Ian Cox. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ma'am Lucid, thank you po, ah. At thank you din po, Ma'am Elsa. Baka sa Saturday, mag-invite kami ng mga taga-regions. Kasi si Parenti. Oh, oh, oh. Ma'am, we'll wait for the list, ah. So we can send. We can send the invitation. Oh, sige po. Oh, oh. No. Tapos okay, yung ibang okay, ano natin, swatas, swatas. Baka pwede na. O, para makapag-share okay, din ma sila, di ba? Magandang makasare sila. Ayun nga, hindi maganda eh. Maganda, na, maganda pag nandiyan sila, di ba? Oo, oh, oh, oh. sila first-hand information sa kind experience. Straight from the experience. Opo, yeah. opo, opo. Sige, we'll wait for the list, Mama. Yung dito, tsaka yung overseas. Huh? Sige we'll po, Mama. We'll also try to get in touch yeah, yeah. with the other okay, ano, polos. Thank you. Ay, oo. Oh, oh. Para bye -bye para, para maganda. Okay, bye-bye po. Bye-bye. Sabi, -bye. Gail. Thank you. Joy. Mary Joy Barcelona. Thank you. Shane Ann Mesa. Thank you. Lance, thank you. Lance. Po. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Lance. Region 3. Thank you po, Field Office 3. Si Ma'am, ano, presentasyon nandiyan kanina. Ma'am, thank you po, ah. Bye-bye. Thank you, Po. <laughs> Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you, Rin, Po. Uh -oh. Salamat, ha. See you again. Good Saturday, Po. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shane. Close to me, Shane. Sabi ko na po. Hi, mag-isa na lang ako.